And good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, good morning, wherever you happen to be listening. Uh, my name is Tom Smith, and I am the director of the Leica Academy and your host for today's program. It is an absolute pleasure to have everybody with us. Um, I couldn't be more excited to, uh, frankly, as you take a break from politics, take a break from watching the news and host this program for you with, with Matt Stewart. We have had a tremendous amount of success in the last you know, six months uh, with these Leica conversations and stay home with Leica programs. And thank you for taking the time to spend it with us. If you have not already heard of Matt Stewart, you're in for a treat. He, for more than 24 years now, he really has been at the forefront of contemporary photography, specifically street photography. He's always engaging. And uh, you know, I, I can't wait to get in the conversation. Without further ado, help me welcome Matt Stewart. Matt, how are you? Hey, Tom. Yeah, good, thanks. Really good. How are you? I'm good. The only thing is I'm getting feedback. So give me one second to fix that. And while I'm fixing it, I want to start with this. Can I just quickly say hello to everyone and thank you so much for, for joining. Um, it's, uh, it's really like I'm seeing lots of participants and lots of nice messages and it's really uh, super cool. So thank you, everyone. Matt, thank you. You know, it, you're coming to us from the Netherlands. And so I should let everybody know it's quite late. So thank you for staying up so late. And, and, and taking part in this. And, uh, you know, we, we, we hope we make it worthwhile for us, uh, for you. Uh, I know it's worthwhile for us because, you know, frankly, uh, we, we were saying at the beginning, the last time I saw you was in January in LA. And yeah. looking back, it was probably one of the best dinners I had in 2020 uh, <laughs> and a very celebratory. Uh, Can I be absolutely honest? You were probably the last person that I saw in 2020. <laughs> well, it, and, and maybe that'll work back in the conversation in terms of the value of photography and recording recording moments. But before we get into the pictures, I want to ask you to take the audience back to mm -hmm. the beginning, not your birth, but the beginning of your life in photography, sort of Matt, um, early to mid 90s, set the stage. What was your life like then? Okay, so um, skate rat, uh, skateboarding, skateboarding, skateboarding. Um, completely obsessed by skateboarding, focused on skateboarding, uh, sponsored skateboarder, um, but never really good enough to go pro, uh, but kind of got the mentality to kind of repeat, 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 you know, try and try and try until you make it, um, which was a really good background to photography because you have to practice and practice and practice, especially with street photography where you can't really control anything. Um, and so skateboarding, um, and then uh, I fell in love uh, which, with a woman, um, and which kind of completely put an end to the skateboarding, um, which in retrospect was a shame. Um, anyway, so, and then I got dumped uh, shortly afterwards. And so I kind of had nothing. Um, but, but you had a, you have not described it this way, but, but so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you worked at a call center, which yeah. I kind of think might be one of the worst experiences uh, one could have or no. Well, you know what? I, I look back on it and I actually think that um, learning to speak to extremely annoyed people um, and make them calm down was a really good um, kind of life skill. And so um, I did that for, I think I did it for about two years and it was pretty, I mean, I, uh, you know, I had no exam results. I was not at university. I was not a pro skateboarder. I got a job and this is the only job I could get. And so I was listening to people complain and I learned how to make everyone happy. Um, oh. And that was like thinking back on it. I, I mean, I take the positives from a lot of things, but that was pretty good like life skill uh, and so moving forward like if I ever had any trouble or worries and you know needed to calm people down I was pretty good at that well you know there are a number of videos and interviews out there and, it, and I, I researched those a bit before we we got on here and uh there's a lot of conversation in terms of how your street photography or has been influenced by the skateboarding experience mm -hmm. and we could talk about that but you know what I, I really want to ask you about is the two photography books that your father gave you and the impact that had. 
Yeah, so um, whilst I was working at the call center, I had, you can imagine me, I actually, I think I had to wear a suit, like, and it would have been a really, like, it would have been a lame suit, you know, call center suit. Uh, and I had a headset on and I was skinny and, you know, going bald and not eating well, just left home. And um, my dad went to the Tate Modern or Tate Britain, I can't remember which one, and he bought me two books randomly, uh, one by Henri Cartier-Bresson, which was an aperture a uh, sort of master's book. And the other one was a Robert Frank uh, photo posh book, little black book. And um, I would just basically take these phone calls. And you know what, maybe I maybe it was because of these books that I, everything seemed to be so calm and chill to, to me, but I would just be taking these phone calls and looking at Cartier-Bresson pictures or Robert Frank pictures and going like, wow, like, wow. Like, I don't know what this is, but these are great. And look at, and you know, I was learning about history because, you know, especially with Cartier Bresson, you know, he was at Gandhi's funeral. He was, uh, you know, Second World War, you know, people being slapped in the face and all this stuff. Um, so I was getting a history lesson. Um, and and uh, yeah, I, I didn't know what it was, but I, I had become sort of addicted to it whilst I was taking these angry people's phone calls. What? And your father was a graphic designer. It was a right. Yeah. Yeah, he was a graphic designer. I mean, so was it just a leap of faith that he, he thought you might be interested in photography or had you had experience with photography he before that? He basically had this son who was failing fast. Um, not that working in a call center is failure in any way, but, you know, he could tell that, you know, I was not happy being shouted at every day. Um, and he was trying to pull things out the stream, basically, you know, oh, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? What do you think of this? And most of the time I'd just be telling him like, you know, uh, yeah, you know leave me alone, you know, uh, kind of sort of sort of immature, like, I don't know what I was, 21, 22. Um, and then, yeah, and then randomly he picked these two books and it was Eureka. It, you know, we, we've gotten to work together with workshops over the years and you're really quite an in-demand instructor now uh, throughout the world, whenever there's a, uh, a chance to work with you, you know, the programs sell out very quickly. And I bring that up to sing your praises, but also to get into the fact that a, your, a workshop had a huge influence on you early on. Can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've done one, one workshop in my life. Um, but it was a good one. And it was with this guy, Leonard Freed, who uh, was an um, uh, American guy, American photographer, Magnum photographer. Um, and it was a three or four day uh, workshop. We sort of lived in this building uh, during the workshop. Um, so that all of the class were there all together. And we basically photographed, drank, ate, spoke, um, and hung out with Leonard, which was, I mean, I, for any of you that don't know who Leonard is, I mean, he was, he's really very underrated, but a, a brilliant uh, Magnum photographer. He, 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 he did, um, uh, you know, great uh, photo stories on race, great photo stories in Germany, Amsterdam. He took one of the most iconic pictures of Martin Luther King. Uh, you know, he's, he got around. Anyway, so it was a real, um, again, and this was my dad. He was like, why don't you go on a workshop? See what, it's, see what this stuff's all about. Um, and yeah, he, so my dad was a graphic designer, he was visual, and so he, I guess he understood that I might get into this kind of stuff, maybe. maybe and, you, and you come back from this, this trip, and if you had to, I'm going to get into some pictures here, but if you had to, to drill down to the, your main takeaway from, from that experience. Um, well, I, I talk about, I have, I have spoken about this recently, but uh, definitely one of the main takeaways is just to be good. Like be a good person. Don't be, don't be. Uh, I, I can't say all my swear words, but just be good. Um, and how you treat people, how you are with people, how you approach people, why you're photographing them, why are you photographing this person? You know, quick moral judgments, moral questions that you have to yourself. Um, have them real quick in the moment. You know, and and you have to be. These are kind of split second. Who are you? Who are you? Uh, and you have to you have to answer it pretty quickly. And if you're if you if you're that guy, fine. If you're that guy, fine. But most of the time, he was good. And I think that was one of the things that really um, uh, kind of resonated with me. 
Well, and so I, I, I read that you you really felt like from 1997 to 1999 you didn't make what you now would consider a, a good picture, but that this one we have got on the screen is one of the first that you felt was successful. Did yeah. You, did, did so, you so 1990, like late early 1997 to 1999, I took hundreds of pictures and I would constantly bring them back to my mom or my dad or my friends and go like, what do you think? What do you think? And you have this kind of, you know, pregnant pause and they go like, oh, yeah, it's whatever, whatever. It's okay. Hmm, you know, weirdo. Um, and then around the time of the millennium wheel going up, um, I had been on Leonard's course and I went out with a, you know, bag of uh, black and white film. And I spent the weekend just photographing around this event, um, which was kind of a big event. It was, it was one of those things that um, uh, could have gone wrong. I mean, we weren't sure whether they were actually gonna get this wheel up. So, you know, there's, there's the photographer in me hoping that they can't and it falls into the Thames and I, you know, <laughs> I get that picture. But anyway, that didn't happen. And, um, and I took maybe four or five rolls of film during that weekend um, with a lot of enthusiasm. And I, I think this is, this is one of the other things that I do a lot. Uh, and it, it, I mean, I enthusiastically photograph uh, and I kind of really get into it. And I think everything is good when I'm doing it. All right. I mean, I don't know if you do this as well, Tom, but you think, oh, yeah, this is good. This is great. Oh, this is excellent. Oh, my God, this is amazing. And then you come back to the work and you look at it when it's been developed and you go like, oh, wow, I was just really excited, wasn't I? I was really excited. But anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, camera doesn't record your excitement and it doesn't care about the story behind the picture though we're going to talk stories you know what it would be great to have a little heart monitor in that camera just on the sh on the shutter button just coming through your finger just going oh my god 150 bpm 150 bpm calm down calm down but um yeah the millennium wheel picture basically a guy turned up towards the end of the weekend and he had a wheel strap to his back and i ran around behind him and i took maybe 18 pictures uh, on black and white film, which is a lot, um, but but I knew it was good. But the exposure was difficult. The guy was, you know, moving around. I had to try and fit the guy's head in between these trees. The saddle had to be in the picture. Everything I was shooting at the time was full frame. You know, it, absolutely no cropping at all. It had to have a black border around it, like Henri Cartier-Bresson, because that was the instruction manual that I'd been given. Um, and yeah, I, on around like the 10th frame, I got it right. And then I carried on. And it's funny looking at that contact sheet now, um, none of the other pictures were right. So one of the things I learned from Leonard um, was, yeah, you may have amazing things happening in front of you, but are you making an amazing photograph of it? Uh, and so the amazing thing happening is one thing, but whether you can stay cool enough and calm enough and work your camera well enough to frame it is a whole different thing. Well, and so one, 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 in, one in 18 was right. One in 18, and, or, or, or one between 1997 and 1999. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I happen to know it was at least four because you, you made postcards of, of some of your four most successful images during that time. Is that right? And, and That's right. Out? Yeah, no, I, um, I needed to get some work doing yeah. this. It's, this, was, this was one of my dad. I mean, my dad's a very wise guy, but he was like, yeah, I mean, you, sure, uh, try and become a photographer. But if you need, if you're going to make money being a photographer, I mean, that's, that's tough. You can be, he said, you can be a, you can be a, a you know, really enthusiastic about photographer and go and get, be, being a photographer and go and get yourself a job. Or you want to be a photographer and make money being a photographer, go for it. But, you know, let, let's see how you do. So I got four postcards done, a run of a thousand of each. I sent them all out to everyone. I think I got um, four phone calls saying, can we see your portfolio? And I got one job. Wow. And so, you know, you really have balanced street photography, which is, you know, clearly difficult to, there's not a lot of demand out there for, for street photographers for hire, but you mm -hmm. balance that with commercial work throughout your career. Yeah. I mean, it's been a hustle. I mean, I think this is the thing with everyone. It's just like, you have to, you, you do your, your personal work and you have to love that. Um, and that actually gets you work because people see the stuff that you do and they go, oh, wow, that's, I, I like that. Some people might want to buy a print. Some people might want to buy a book. 
uh, and then maybe you do workshops, you know, like Leonard, like me, like whoever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then every now and then you may do a job, a corporate job or something that's completely not related apart from the fact that you have a camera and you press a button. Um, and then sometimes you get commission to do street photography or whatever, you know, advertising. Well, there's some questions from the audience, uh, Matt, about when does Leica come to the picture and, and why Leica? And I specifically put this up here because I, I, I know it has to do with, with trying to feel inv invisible. And I wonder if you can give us, when do you first get a Leica in your hand? And then tell us the story behind this picture. Okay, so Henri Cartier-Bresson, Robert Frank, you do a quick bit of research and you find out that both of them use Leicas. Um, and then you go on a course with Leonard Fried and you realize that he uses a Leica. And you realize that you're definitely nowhere near as good as these guys <laughs> and they're using this thing. So you better get one of these things. Um, and you're still got, not gonna be anywhere near as good as these guys, but at least you're using the same thing as they're using. So um, I got a Leica, I think in about um, just about 1999, um, when my grandma died, she left me money uh, in her will enough to buy a Leica or pay off my credit card debt. And uh, I had this, you know, this kind of business question in my head, the devil and the angel going, you know, well, pay off the credit card, pay off the credit card, buy a Leica, buy a Leica. And uh, I bought a Leica, I bought a black a la carte Leica. And um, that's when uh, I really kind of really got into using the M camera and how, how that works and how it feels and how discreet it is on the street. Wait, and your, your first book, which uh, all of these pictures are from, the, um, All That Life Can Afford, the, the first edition is, is much sought after and, and, and so, sold out at this point. And you're getting ready to, uh, you're taking pre-orders on the second or third, third edition? It's the second edition, it's the third printing, yeah. Third printing. I, just to, to sort of get into pictures, the story behind some of these pictures and answer some of the technical questions people are asking. Mm -hmm. A shot like this, can you just walk us through uh, very briefly, you know, how's the camera set up? How, how, how do you uh, increase your chances of be feeling invisible? Okay, so first thing is, um, I remember this, taking this picture quite vividly. Um, first of all, I saw the kid with the balloon. Um, and I walked around the bench and I learned this from Mark Rebo, who's a super famous like Magnum photographer who, who took the picture of the, um, at the Eiffel Tower, uh, the guy sort of trapped in the Eiffel Tower. Um, and he said, if you, get, if you get the chance, cause I used to ask lots of stupid questions. I used to go to all the talks. I used to be the like kid who asked the stupid questions. So I was like, you know, what, what would your advice be to a young photographer who's starting out you know, what would you, what, what, what would you recommend you do? He said, if you, get, if you get the chance, walk around something, just walk around it if you can. So back to the bench picture with the, with the balloon, I walked around and as I walked around, I, I actually started just shooting a few pictures off. This is with film. So this is kind of wasteful, but I was just like, you know, click, click, click. Cause I didn't, yeah, you know, I got really close. This was a 28 millimeter lens. So this was like a Elmara and a, it's super close. And I knelt down next to the big guy in the foreground. Um, and I just stayed there and took maybe seven or eight photographs of him. And at one point, everything came together. The balloon blew over the kid's head. The dog turned to me and stuck its tongue out. And the man pointed to the floor. And I remember it almost like a kind of crescendo of things happening. And every now and then this happens when everything clicks into place. And especially when I was younger, I, could, I almost felt like a kind of, I know this sounds funny, but almost like a fly. Cause so you see everything kind of going really like, Ooh. and um, I don't know if I'm like that anymore, by the way, I think maybe with age, it sort of dulls down a bit, but I saw this whole thing happen. And um, yeah, then I got up uh, and walked away and not, none of them saw me or, knew that I was there. Wow. Which is wow. Really, really straight, it's super close. Like, I don't know, like 28 mil lens with this guy. It's, it's like less than a meter away. Sure, sure. So it's knowing, it's knowing you're geared to the, to the point that you're then able to not think about it, I, I would yeah. imagine. And some people are asking about your favorite lens and it's more so a 35 than, than a 28. 
Or yeah, yeah, 35, most of them are 35. 35 is my absolute go-to lens. Um, I, and I got a, I actually had a moment of using a Sommelux and a Summicron, a 35, 1.4 and F2. Um, and I think uh, when push comes to shove, I went with the Summerlux in the end. I think the 1.4 is the, was the one for me. And you know why? It's because the one that was the one that Leonard used. <laughs> well, Matt, I, I'd be remiss in, in talking about your work if we didn't show this picture, which seemed early on to be one of your signature images. It's the cover of a, a book called Street Photography Now. Yeah. So, and it also seems to be a fit into a tip that is consistent with a lot of your work, which is the importance of getting low. Can you tell the story here? Um, well, yeah, I mean, this was this was a, actually a really boring day um, and a day that not much was happening. And sometimes that can almost get you into a groove. You're like, you walk out there and you think, oh, this is, nothing's happening. This is dull, you know, I'm bored. And I sat on the steps and I just, you know, I was, I was probably worn out. And I just, and then I just started seeing these legs walking past, legs walking past, legs walking past. I shot about a roll of film of just legs walking past and I st stayed there for about half an hour. And you do have to kind of be open to looking foolish um, doing this. You know, you have to think like, you know, what, what the hell, I'm just that guy who's kneeling on the, on the floor um, photographing people's legs. Um, and after about half an hour of doing that and staying pretty bloody still, a pigeon walked past and actually this pigeon kept on walking backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. It was almost like it was posing for me. So it's like a promenading pigeon. Um, and one of the frames, I got lucky with the legs. But and you, you, you knew it though? You had a sense that you had something? something I felt something happen. It was, to be absolutely honest, I knew that there was a pigeon in the picture. Sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> but no, the, the legs, the legs, uh, uh, was to, I mean, it was up in the right-hand corner. If, and again, it felt like something had happened, but well, I don't think you can ever, with that, that kind of stuff, you can't really ever actually know that you got it. Well, Matt, we're gonna I'll clip through a, a few more of the street images before, before we get into your, your latest book. But I, I wonder, you, you have this term going on patrol. Mm. And can you, what do you mean by that? What, what does that mean to you? Well, um, going <laughs> going on patrol, um, it's there's to, it's to do with um, degrees of engagement, I guess. And going on patrol um, is something that I would do every day. I, uh, I mean, I still do it every day. But it, like when I was living in London, I would do it every day, and it would be going out there to make sure um, that nothing was happening. Uh, or at least making sure you know that everything was guarded and nothing was happening. But um, yeah, going on, going on patrol, what was literally that? Just making sure that, that nothing was happening. But I, in the same breath, hoping that something might happen, but kind of just checking it out and, and making sure everything was safe. And it's a strange sort of a strange mindset that you have to work with is that you actually have to hope that something does happen. Um, and, and are, are, what are for you, what are triggers? What are things that make you stop and have a sense that something might happen? Right. Um, well, one thing for certain is sound. Uh, the first okay. thing that you hear is sound. So with this guy, he was yawning. Um, I heard him yawn on the other side of the street. I've never heard someone yawn so confidently. Um, and if I had not heard him, I would not have seen this. So I would say sound is one of the first things that you should really, um, it is a trigger. Like if you ever hear a bang, you, you turn for it. If you ever hear a scream, you you turn for it. If you ever hear a crash, you, you're there. So triggers, sound is the initial trigger in a lot of cases, or color is a trigger. Um, but I think this one is an example where you were glad you didn't have earphones on. A hundred percent. Yeah, this was this was a picture where I followed the the person who was doing the flip. So I heard a conversation, I was being nosy um, or probably eerie uh, and uh, heard what the, this kid wanted to do. Like his friend had said, oh, why don't you, you do your somersault? And then he said, oh, I have to practice it on the grass. And I was just listening into this conversation between two school kids. And lo and behold, he went over and ran up and did a flip on the grass and no one else in the um, frame knew that he was about to do this apart from, apart from me. Um, and this is this is a one frame catch, by the way. This is 
press the button uh, and I got him upside down. Um, you, you, how about light? One of the things that really stood out to me in, in look, going back through um, the, your first book is that there's a very similar quality to light throughout the book. Um, this, for, for example, may be one of the more contrasty or you know, um, uh, golden light, uh, but many of them aren't. Can you? What time of day did you shoot most of these? Well, this is the thing. I mean, I this is. I guess this is down to obsession again. A lot of the pictures were taken any day, uh, any time, uh, whatever the light, depending on whether something was happening. Um, and the the difficult thing with this type of photography is you don't ever know when something's going to happen. Um, I could have narrowed it down to just go out when the light was good and hope that something happened. But because I kind of maybe I'm a slow learner, uh, I just went out the whole time photographing to hope something was happening. Gotcha. So all of these pictures are, uh, this is probably at lunchtime, this one. Um, and, uh, you know, the, one, the one, earlier one was seven o'clock in the evening. So they're all taken anytime, as long as something is happening. So it, just to clarify for, for the audience, you know, you, the first edition sold out, second edition sold out. You, this is your, you're on your third or second printing? So I did a first edition and I printed it twice. Uh, right, got it, got it. So same book, 2000 times. Um, and now I'm doing the book again. It's a smaller book. It's a better edited book. Um, this book that you just shown, which I love, um, one of the big problems with it is that it weighed a ton and sending it around the world is a kind of, uh, it costs almost as much as a book. Right, right. So, so I mean, how many pictures are in the first book? Uh, there's around 80 and in the new one, there's like 49. 49. Yeah. What, let me go back to the the picture we just had up. So I mean, there's there's one thing uh, in terms of the first you you took the learnings from the first book and in terms of shipping and that kind of thing, and that's affecting the also also the the, the edit. I let in way too many pictures. I was I was. Uh... Um, well, I think I was... Talk about that for a second, not not to tear this book apart because I love it. But what <laughs> I, I think for our audience, what is the learning that you had? And let me bring this picture up that is not in the first book, but is in the newest edition. Why is this in it? Why did it beat out an old picture? What is it? What are the what's the criteria? Um, OK, so I guess with this picture, it, there's a lot of things in it. And this is uh, it's funny, isn't it, really? Because and it's almost embarrassing to, to say some of the things that I like about this picture. But this picture, as far as the colors are concerned, there's um, purple flower, there's a purple bag, there's a man in a purple top, there's a lady in a brown top, and there's a lady in a yellow top. So immediately there's color synchronicity, which is something that I look for. Uh, and then there's all of these strange gestures. And if you look from the lady in the, in the taxi, her arm is hitting 11 o'clock. And then all of the arms come round, like tick, 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 through to, you know, it's like a sort of, it's like a fan of arms. Um, and for me, I'm interested in gestures, I'm interested in colors, and I'm interested in uh, tiny little details that uh, only I really care about, quite frankly, sure. to be absolutely honest. Um, and, and, and that's why for the first three years, most people looked at my pictures and it gave me the kind of the blank. But yeah, I'm I'm into I'm into minute details, and I'm uh, yeah I'm into color. And and an audience member is asking um, Sergio wants to know uh, why did you go to uh, color? When did that actually? Will Will is the person asking this? When when did that shift happen, and why? Um, I think that when that happened in around 2004, um, and it's not really radical. I mean, at, at that point, I mean, but for for me, um, street photography was black and white. Um, and I, you know, I photographed and photographed. I tried to be, I tried to photograph people jumping over puddles. I tried to photograph, you know, witty pictures in museums. And I tried to do all this stuff like, you know, oh, it caught your breasts on, you know, I tried and tried and tried. And, and there's a point where you kind of, you just, it, like, it, you realize like, you ain't, you're not gonna, you ain't gonna, you're not gonna beat that. <laughs> Wait, okay. and and so and it's and it's t completely not radical in any way but it's like i'm going to shoot in color because you know what i don't see much street photography in color 
at the time, you know, there was, I mean, literally there was, um, you know, Joel Marovitz, Alex Webb. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, can't, I can't even remember who was shooting color um, then. Wait, you, you often get asked this question, so people are asking it now in the, in the Q&A, in, in terms of developing your own style, are you conscious? I mean, you made a choice to shoot color. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings? You're, I mean, you've been doing this now 24 years. You teach workshops and you're in a position of, you know, you're no longer the, the, the rising guy. You're, you're established. So people come to you for questions. And this question of style, mm -hmm. how, how do you, what are your thoughts about it? Uh, I mean, the, the, I think style, there's a lot of things that can help you kind of nourish a style. Um, and I think, and, in, and this is, sounds like, and I don't, I, I'm not big on rules. I, and we can talk about that later. I'm not really interested in giving people like, oh, you want to do this to be like me, then do this. Oh, but, yeah, we, we know that not only uh, because you're saying it, but also you, you know, you got a, a, a huge response on your Instagram recently with this post that street photography is not a sport, a rule or a competition. Yeah. And, and we'll speak to that a little bit. Why, why post that? What, what was that a reaction to? Oh, it was a re it's a reaction to um, all of the competitions that are out there. There's all of the um, the, the ways that uh, some people actually photograph on the street as though it's like hunting um, aggressively. I mean, I, potentially, let's not get let's not go too far down this rabbit hole. But there's a degree of you know toxic masculinity in street photography. Uh, a lot of people getting out their uh, aggression on people um, and that, you know this kind of stuff I, I believe actually has to has to stop or at least you know people need to think about what they're doing it's not just about going out there and hunting uh, well, you know there's a lot of a, a lot of language that is used with uh, photography potentially in general but you know shooting catching you know snapping yeah. my god you know it's we need to chill it out a bit and so I one of the things that I kind of I guess I'm rallying against is the the sort of the negative attitude that people use uh, with their cameras. Well, and you certainly not only have set an example with that, but you've also been with your Instagram very generous in promoting other photographers and uh, books in particular, but other photographers are giving giving them the the limelight and there's a sense of generosity that um, is re quite refreshing. And it, it seems like during this COVID period, uh, you know, since March or so, you really have leaned into that. Uh, be, yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny. I, I think photography almost as a, uh, especially, yeah, a lot of photographers try and keep their cards themselves and they're interested in their business is their business is their business, you know. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, and whereas, um, I don't know, I, I'm more interested in, well, let's be absolutely honest, I'm sick of looking at my pictures. OK, uh, I mean, I'm really excited for the next one, but I'm way more interested in other people's pictures. Like, you know, that's that's what I, I, I find inspiring. I mean, I do. I'm, you know, I'm inspired by my by what I do and what I take. But really, like when I, a new book by someone else lands on my lap, you know, like, that's the thing I, you know, I, I sit down with and look at it. And I, I don't do you reckon I go how, how much do you think I look through my own book, Tom? <laughs> look through it <laughs> you, you you it's i mean so that's a question i want to put up make sure people know your your instagram and and yeah anybody who um you know i will warn you if you if you look at matt's instagram um not only is there there <laughs> great tips but you're going to want to buy photo books and uh, not just his but there's a number of photo books there you also if you look up uh uh photo book jousting right that's the hashtag yeah. photo book jousting. yeah, yeah that's uh, a, a a hashtag that i think ed templeton um uh, invented. Um, and he's also a, a, a avid photo book collector. But yeah, I mean, I do, I, I kind of, I have this, I, I'm super excited to share pictures, especially during this time, which is difficult, you know, other people's work, um, so that people can get inspired by other people's work and maybe buy the books or ju maybe just see the pictures on, on my Instagram. But um, I do realize that it can seriously damage your health and your bank account. <laughs> I know, absolutely. I, I'm both inspired and depressed when I look at your, your uh, feed because I, I realize, you know, I, I have a similar uh, obsession in, in find inspiration for the books. And everybody listening, by the end, somebody's asked this. Um, I've, I've asked Matt to share 
I don't know if the answer was one photo book you would recommend to everybody or the photo book you go back to most often. We're going to hold the answer because we want to keep them listening. We're going to answer that at the end. Okay. Uh, but you know, let's. I'm going to just try to pull some questions from the audience here. Uh, talk to us about you know you're you're in um, the Netherlands and you travel a great deal. We're going to mm -hmm. in just a moment. We're going to look at your latest book. Um, you know, in, into the fire. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm curious though you're a big advocate of people photographing in their own backyard. Yeah. Talk, why is that so important? Uh, I think it's the only thing you can do consistently um, and seriously and obsessively. Uh, unless you have, a, you know, a trust fund, um, it, you really do need to photograph, you know, where you are. And I think it helps you to understand who you are uh, and yeah, sort of existentially it's, it's interesting. Uh, and I think if you just, you know, you jump on a plane and you go to, um, I don't know, somewhere exotic, um, for two, three, four, five, six weeks, let's say you've got loads of money, seven weeks. I still don't think you're photographing, you know, who you are, you know, where you are, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Who you are. There's something to you know if um, certainly developing projects and the consistency in your own backyard, but but also this idea that you it goes back to this question of style. Mm -hmm. When I can recognize a Matt Stewart picture, whether it was shot in LA or whether it was shot in London, then I think that's a clue for people of you know do they have a distinctive style? Is it dependent if it's not dependent on a place? That it's a way of seeing. Yeah, it's a way of seeing, and it's how and it's how you. Uh, you know, some some people you know see poetry. Uh, I connect things. I'm a connect. I connect stuff. Um, you know, some people uh, photograph. You know, graphics. You know, some do. Yeah, photograph shitloads of shadows. Um, you know, people have different things that they they sort of beeline for. But I think uh, a style can depends on how you photograph it, what you photograph it with, and you know, where you photograph it and how you think about things. I mean, it's a hot, it's not just like, oh, it's a camera and a lens. It, it, it's a lot to do with who you are. Well, let's, let's get into um, the, the end of the fire book. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, this is the cover I chose. So there were two covers. And so the, the naked Barbies on the front. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in bringing up these, these pictures here, talk about how this project started and then, Matt, I'm also curious, is your approach to this different than, do you make a distinction between documentary and street photography? How is your approach different or is it? No, no, I'm just, to be absolutely honest, um, I'm a photographer. Like, that's what I am. And then there's all these uh, silly terms that people use to, um, you know, so, so you find that the labels are not useful for you at this were they were they at the beginning of your career but not so much now or no i didn't know what they, i didn't know what street photography was at the beginning of my career i didn't yeah. I, I just knew that it, i really liked those photographs and when i was looking through the book i almost wanted to eat them you know i was this interested I, like they they were tasty um and i think um moving forward then i you, you get sort of pigeonholed into this thing that's called street photography and then you know various people decide that there's various things that you have to do to be, you know, constrained in that bubble. Um, and then you think, well, actually, you know, I'm not really interested in being constrained by anything. I'm just going to go and keep on going to go and kind of go and photograph. Yeah, I've, or, I've got a quote here from you that photography is about engagement with people and, and place. And for you, in a lot of ways, just an excuse to a reason to be out, a mm, reason to go. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with, with there's, there's either there's, there's candid photography where you don't speak to anyone or there's, uh, there's, there's photography where you engage with people. Uh, and I think with this particular uh, body of work, I absolutely had to engage with people because you can't turn up to, uh, you know, a camp in the middle of the desert with a camera and an English accent and think you're going to be... Um, <laughs> candid <laughs> there's no way so I spent uh, around four months on and off um, there uh, getting to know people um, uh, photographing you know real candid moments but also for making portraits of people um, who I knew who I got to know um, 
And so it, it actually felt, um, to me, it felt sort of really refreshing to actually, as opposed to just sort of glimpsing people in the street who you, who you do have a, an empathy for, you know, you have a, you, there's a reason you photograph these people. But, but in this particular place, I could, I could actually get to know everyone. I could decide who, was, who I wanted to photograph and, you know, and, and I knew their name. I, I, you know, I know I, I, if I can just about wreck my brain, I can remember the name of the dog, you know? But, but, but when you, you had heard about this area, um, a friend recommended it to you. And, you know, you, though you had heard, I'll put a picture up here of, of this place called Salvation Mountain, which mm -hmm. is a bit of a, a destination. Mm -hmm. Slab City, as I understand it is, and I've been to Salvation Mountain and I've been to, I wish Further I could remember down. the name of it, but yeah. there's a really great bar at uh, so, uh, Salton Sea. Did you go there? Did you go to the uh, bar with all the dollars on the walls? And yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but so this this place is fairly you've well known. The, you've done the tourist trail, Tom. <laughs> yeah, I I stopped about here and I, yeah, I headed back to Palm Springs. But 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 <laughs> you you go there and uh, am I right that you you didn't Google it? You didn't research Slab City? You just go? No, no I was um, uh, during that time I was working uh, with uh, Magnum. So I and I wanted to get a project that I wanted to do. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, I could really get my teeth into and this felt right. I mean, I was, um, you know, a stranger. I wanted to live in this place that was extraordinary. Um, I wanted borrow to borrow a friend's VW van and, and borrow, you... borrow my friend's, uh, T3 West, Westphalia, um, it was an automatic one, like 1986, I think, or I can't remember. Anyway, it had a few problems along the way, but anyway, drove that there. It was like the Scooby-Doo van. And um, I had the sat nav on my phone and I just head, to, head towards Nyland and got there and drove in. And uh, it was quite intimidating, I would say, um, just because of the, not because of the people, but more because of the geography, because everything is, you know, it's, it's in the desert. It's, there's no streetlights. People either live in RVs like this green one, or they live in, um, you know, crazy sort of shacks uh, that they've made themselves, um, and yeah, it's pe people are people are kind of they're not your usual people that you see walking down Oxford Street. So, but it was important at the very beginning it, it, that you you told them, you know, I'm I'm Matt, I'm a photographer, and yeah. I'm here to work on a project, right, right from uh, the get go. Uh, right? This is the thing: be authentic, be genuine. You know, I'm I'm here to take pictures. Um, I'm Going to be photographing here for the next two or three months. Um, I show you everything I shoot. This is what I do. I'm a photographer. I'm from England. Um, you can. You it, know, what was your nickname? London. It, 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 it seems like nicknames are important, uh, not only for uh, you know anonymity. If I can't say that word, but uh, but but it seems like it's just part of the culture of of this area. Everybody has a nickname. Yeah, I think you have a you you have a nickname if you don't want to be traced it and what so it's it's how many months five months or no, from... four months what was it it's like february march april may june yeah. and and you know what is your your takeaway from from that experience and we'll talk about the making the book in a little bit but what what was your you're still in touch with some of the folks that you met while you're yeah, there yeah no i still speak to a few of them on uh, facebook um a lot of the, a lot of the slabbers are connected on social media and things like that um uh, my takeaway was that kind of everyone was great um to, i i didn't meet anyone that was um, that I felt threatened by, um, and just to sort of be genuine with your, with the experience and with the people that you meet and who they are and how you are, you know, um, I, yeah, I can't, I, I found it quite, it felt pretty normal. No, no, normal was not, that's not the word I expected. I mean, it's quite, un, quite unusual, but what do we mean by normal? Yeah, what I mean, you, mean? you adapt. It's like, you don't turn up with your, you know, hi, I'm, you know, Matt from London and I live in a, you know, two bedroom house and I have a car and family of four. I'm, it's like, no, I'm going to be one of you guys. 
you know, it, it's described as one of the last fr free places in America or the last free place in, in America. Did were you tempted to uh, stay longer or did you get pulled into that at all or or was it too oh totally i mean if i didn't have uh, you know a lovely young family uh, and i was a you know single guy i would be there probably now uh, it, it was very attractive but the other thing i guess is that i was from england and so uh, my three-month visa had to keep on being renewed i couldn't hang out in america forever because at some point I would have got kicked out. I find that really interesting, man. We've talked about this before where, you know, an English accent in, in the US and certainly in other places goes a long way uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, people sort of softening. And yeah, I mean, I had lots of, I've had, well, I've had lots and lots of experiences with the, and I don't, I guess it, this is a funny thing to say, but with the English accent, I even have it here. I, you know, I get, people come out and say, you know, and they talk to me in, in, in Dutch saying, you know, what the hell are you doing? Whatever that is in Dutch. And then I go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, and they're like, oh, you're English. And I, and it's really kind of, it, it puts them off their guard and um, it allows me to, uh, I don't know. It, it must be something about the English accent that sounds kind of stupid because it's just every time, I, you know, every time it, I say, "Oh, I'm sorry," they're like, it, oh, "Does okay. it work the other way?" I mean, if Americans going to uh, to Europe, I, I haven't experienced the same sort of, uh, you know, I, I guess I it depends say, on your accent, but I, I think as long as you, especially in England, well, this is interesting. Especially in England, if you say please and thank you, you're cool. If you don't say please, and <laughs> if you don't say please and thank you as an American in England, you're in trouble. That's good travel tip. If you remember only one thing, everybody listening, please and thank you goes a long way. It really, uh, in England, it really does. And like, I was, my uh, partner is is Dutch. And when, when she, like, when I first met her 10 years ago, she would not say please and thank you so much because they have it in the, in the way they ask. They were like, I, I would say, oh, would you like a cup of tea? And she'd say, sure. And I'd be like, <laughs> like, would you like a cup of tea or not? Like, yes, please. Or no, thank you. Sure doesn't does not translate in English. Does it translate the same way? <laughs> yeah, I, I've got so many questions I want to ask you, but and it, we're going to talk about the editing of the book, which is is a bit of a COVID story. Uh, that it yeah. was you you didn't meet the publisher in person. It was all done remotely. Yes. So I was approached in April um, by uh, Keith uh, Keith Cullen, who runs Satanta Books, which is at Satanta Books on Instagram. We'll and put the link uh, to, to the book in the, in the chat window for everybody. He's basically a um, super, super nice guy. Uh, uh, he's, for a start, he's trustworthy um, and he's honest and he's enthusiastic. And he's just like, I really like that slab work you did. And I've got my, my friend Niall, uh, Niall McDermott has given me your email and I just want to like maybe do a book. Do you want to do a book? And I was like, well, sure, yeah, it's like, I'm nothing else going on, <laughs> I'm stuck at home, let's do it. And so he put me in touch with um, a young designer that, that works with him called Tom. And we just, you know, we, we got to work at trying to put a sequence together. Tom put the first sequence together. Um, and then we kind of broke it apart, put it back together um, and made a, a book with 50 pictures. How important, I mean, the, the first, it sounds like uh, your first book, uh, you edited uh, all of the editions, you've primarily edited them yourself? No, the first book I had help from the designer um, okay. who encouraged me to put in as much as I could. Um, this book, um, yeah, I, I would say Tom put the initial kind of template down with, with his edit because um, I didn't really know where to start, to be absolutely honest. I was too close to it. And then from seeing his first edit, we kind of chiseled away at it and moved things around. Um, I also got lots of help from uh, Trent Park and Norel uh, Altio uh, and Gus Powell in New York, mm -hmm. uh, and they were super handy. They, they, um, they. I remember Trent strongly advising against two pictures being put in the book to the point that he phoned me up for an hour to dissuade me from putting them in, uh, and um, I didn't put them in. Uh, but yeah, the the sequencing was great. I mean, it gave me something to do over that time. It, there's, there's some real subtleties in in the book uh, that I, I really love. Uh, this picture, this picture in particular, and then the way that this scene uh, repeats 
uh, or at least this framing repeats later in later in the book here. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. a lovely uh, thing to see. There's a lovely rhythm to it. Uh, and there, there's some subtle details also. Uh, talk about the choice to, you know, it's not finished on the back. Yeah, no, it's rough. It's it's there's, it's complete cardboard on the back. It's like the card, and it's not it's not cut, and and so it's a gloss gloss on the front, and it's rough on the back. And what I really like when I'm going through the book is that you one hand is on the back cover, and it feels like the concrete that is Slab City, yeah. and the front has the gloss. So it's almost to do with the the, the sort of the bones of the place. It's, uh, you know, I encourage everybody to, to check it out. And uh, wh while it's still in print, you know, there's a video out there, Matt, of, of one of your first shows in, in the U.S. at the Leica store in Miami. Uh, and I encouraged everybody to pick up a Matt Stewart print while it was still affordable. So that was uh, great. That was a really good show. That was with Pete. Pete. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so I, I say the same thing about this book. You got to get it while you while you still can. Um, let's talk a little bit about a hashtag that is more recent and nowhere, yeah. your reaction to, you know, what you've been doing in, uh, in, in the Netherlands and, and your reaction, uh, how this COVID period has affected your photography. Sure, yeah. The, the pictures um, from the Netherlands have, have basically been the last six months. So these are uh, pictures um, that I've made not of people, like my sort of, my the deal with this year was that I was just not going to photograph people. It was my sort of New Year's resolution. I was just going to photograph stuff, um, especially as this is a new country. So I was just going to travel around and see see stuff, um, and nothing from nowhere. I mean, the Netherlands isn't nowhere. It's obviously a place, but there's it's 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 very different to the hustle and the bustle of the places I used to spend a lot of my time in. Um, and so nowhere is um, nowhere in particular, um, but also I'm uh, I'm nothing. So I'm nothing from nowhere, and that, which is which is a slight riddle. Well, well, so explain that a little bit more. I'm I'm in. A, so well, I've it, I've come from being I've come from being someone from somewhere. And you're, you're taking a very humble humble approach. Uh, no, I've, I've come from it, yeah. being someone from somewhere, and now I'm. Nothing from nowhere. It, it's an interview I read said that you don't think of yourself as an artist. No. Is that still I, true? Yeah, I, I think of myself as a photographer and a, um, that's what I am. I think people use art to elevate themselves. I think art is a, to, to commodify stuff. So if you want to sell something, call yourself an artist. Gotcha, gotcha. But but the so the pictures are the the instinct is of interest and it's for you ultimately. That's your motivation. You're making pictures of things you're curious about, things you're interested in. You know what? If we took it to the shrink, it, they're probably mainly for my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, I'm asking this? You know, as we start to get towards the end, thank you all for for being with us. If you got any last questions for for Matt, please submit them now. I would try to get to as many of them as, as make sense as possible. Uh, so now is your best chance if, if you've got something you feel like fits in with the, the theme of what we're talking about. You know, at the beginning, I asked you about your way of shooting and this idea of patrol and going out mm -hmm. to make sure nothing's going on. Mm -hmm. But it seems like now you flip that a little bit. You go out expecting something to happen. Is that right? Uh, you have, uh, I mean, there's a, a with, positive thinking, which I am a positive thinker, you do have to expect something's going to happen. And if you expect something's going to happen, it generally does. If you think something is not going to happen, it generally doesn't. And so the mindset is extremely important, especially with street photography, because you're going out into nothingness, hoping. And if you go out there on patrol, generally nothing happens because you don't want anything to happen. But if you go out there expecting something to happen, hoping for something to happen, things generally do. And I think the mindset is extremely important and uh, uh, as well as the be good, you know, be good and expect something to happen, which kind of means that you're going out as a, you know, this sort of free spirit, hoping and expecting. And if you have, if you have that, uh, you know, I don't want to start sounding religious or kind of, we're not going to get into some kind of weird cult here, but if you go out That's there- another with, workshop. 
<laughs> yes, extra. Um, if you go out there with that kind of philosophy and that kind of mindset, more than most, those kind of things do happen. Things do, because you are, you are so tuned in. I've, I was saying the other day to, you know, going out with Joel Maravitz, he's extremely positive, extremely enthusiastic, extremely warm, loves the light, loves the people, loves the touch, loves the gesture. If you go out photographing with him, you get tuned in so much more. You see so much more because you're kind of in that, you're in that bubble. Well, you, you know what, Matt, on that, that topic, let me go back. We're, we're, we're going to, for everybody listening, we're going to wrap up here just shortly, but let's get a, just a couple more stories from Matt. And that idea of shooting with Joel Meyerowitz, I'd be remiss if we didn't give you a chance to actually tell that story. Oh, well, this one I've told a hundred thousand million times, Tom, so I'm going to be really quick. Um, oh, I've got an email from Joel a couple of weeks before this, and I went out with Joel. Um, he said, oh, I like your work. And I met up with Joel. It was the first time I met, met up with him, and we went for a walk. And during that walk, um, this poster that I walked past hundreds of times um, on the particular day that I was with Joel, um, that someone had dumped a skip in front of it. And um, I said to Joel, you know, look, Look at that. He, it was it was a pretty cool moment. It's uh, and I think for you for you to get a call from someone and, and now to be able to call him a, a friend. We put in the, the chat window, you know, a, a few years back where you, you did a, a live interview with him. So there's a link on YouTube for people to. Check oh, yeah, out. that was actually that was really one of the best uh, sort of experiences for me. Um, I don't know if it was one of the best experiences for Joel, but it was a great night. We had a, a really good chat and just spoke about photography very naturally, uh, pretty much like you and me right now, apart from he's a better photographer than you. Two. He's a better, I'll, 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 I'll take it. I, I'll take it. You know, I, I want to, we're going to get to the book question, everybody, but I want to go back and share one other piece here. Um, and that's this, Matt. Mm -hmm. uh, for everybody, we didn't. I didn't pass these by Matt to ask permission, so hopefully he's not upset with me for sharing family. No, 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 no problem. You, you know, um, we started at the beginning, and your father, you know, astutely gave you, took a chance, gave you two photo books. You're you're deeply involved in uh, or influenced by photo books, and in fact, you're restarting your own imprint, uh, Plague Plague Press. Plague Press, yeah, it seemed like the best year to come up with that um, that name. So I want to just ask you about your own kids. Uh, are they interested in photography? What, what? No, they're really into monster trucks. <laughs> uh, no, they're, they're, they don't mind being photographed, which is nice. Um, in fact, Felix here, he, he, he's a kind of natural. He just, he's not phased by it, um, probably because I photograph them so much. And that's something that I also recommend, you know, people to do, especially at the moment is, yeah, there's there's never going to be a time where you spend as much time with your family getting as close to your family as you do as this year and so uh you know whether it's for positive reasons or negative reasons that you are so close you should photograph it um there will never let's hope be a year um like this again um but 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 on the flip side the 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 the, the relationships and the contact that we have with our families um, has been precious to me anyway. And, you know, here I am speaking from my privileged point of view, but, you know, I would probably never spend that much time with my kids in a year again. And so I've been photographing them a lot. Um, whether the pictures are good, bad, ugly, I don't know. But I've, what I do know is I've been recording it. And I think, um, you know, I can't really do it out on the street at the moment. And so I've been taking it inside. And I think that is something that has been really revelatory for me this year. You know, the fact that I can and should uh, photograph my family. And um, which is something, I mean, certainly historically you haven't done it. You wouldn't, if you, may, if you did it, you didn't share it publicly or it was with an iPhone, but you, you've kind of incorporated that into your practice more in a more serious way. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and potentially I'll, I'll make a book on, on, on them at some point. Um, but yeah, I, I think sort of moving forward, it's, this year has actually helped me to to sort of branch out and, and and experience different things. You know, photographing architecture, photographing. I'm, I found this amazing forest recently, which which has this terrible history from the Second World War in it. But I'm really interested in the. Oh, and people. By the way, people go swimming naked in the morning in the river there too. 
So like it's got everything. It's got, you know, birth and life and naked and death. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm spending my hour a, a day that I'm allowed to go out and walk photographing there. Wow. Wow. Well, it, you know, we're getting towards, towards the end here, Maddie. I'm going to ask you, we're going to reveal the book, the recommended <laughs> book. But <laughs> recommended book okay. is and, and there's many on your of course on your Instagram, but we wanted to drill you down to just one, which admittedly, you know, I know is probably like asking for your favorite child, but uh, but but you were able to get down to the one. But before we we get there, is there anything you know you anything we didn't cover? Anything you want to share with the you know folks that are listening today? Um. Uh. I, politics. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I, I, got, I thought of another question, but go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. 2016 politics happened to me. And I think that's something that is also um, really important to try to express yourself photographically. Uh, I mean, with, with, for me, photography is everything. So it's my family, it's the streets, it's the people I speak to, the people I don't speak to. And it's also how I feel. And, and one of the things that I, I think has really happened to me over the last four years has been this kind of... Uh, this kind of eruption of how I feel politically. And I think it's important to express yourself photographically with that as well. Very good, very good. Well, let's reveal uh, the, the book that if, that you go back to quite often, that you, you find inspiration from. Right, well, this is actually the best copy of this particular book. I have two copies of this book. Um, and so this is, see that, the one that I photographed there is a soft cover. That's the one that I look at all the time, but I, put, I bought the hard cover out just because it's on show, Tom, and I wanted to, so I have two copies of this book. Ah. Um, the soft cover book, uh, I probably blame that for um, the, uh, for, for one of the reasons, like if this was taken to the court of law, this is one of the reasons why my first marriage failed. Because I would look through this Wait, book. Because you were so into this, this like book? Or? Obsessively. I wouldn't, watch, I wouldn't watch TV. I wouldn't hang out. I, I would just look at that book. It's, no, no, so no. it's Winogrand, Figments from the Real World. It's the best of Winogrand. It's curated by, by John Tchaikovsky. It's got um, five or six different sections. There's a political section. There's a street section. There's an animal section. Um, there's, I mean... It, and, you know, it, you, you know, in another interview, Matt, you, you described uh, Cartier-Bresson is the Beatles. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Frank is Bob Dylan. No, so what's, the Rolling what's, Stones. What's that? The Rolling Stones. <laughs> oh, no, no. It, I definitely it was Bob Dylan. But, but I, and I would argue Frank is more Bob Dylan than Rolling Stones. But, but here's True. what I want to know. What, what's Winogrand in musical oh. terms? Oh, in musical terms, I, I would say that he's... <sighs> Something jazzy. Um, he's, I don't know. Give me someone good at jazz, Duke Ellington or someone. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's loose. He improvises. Um, he's not particularly structured. He also can show sad. He can show happy. He can show, um, you know, he can show. My, uh, there we go. We got the answer. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Miles Davis would be so. Winogrand's Miles Davis. There we, we take go. we take Miles. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, it's nice to see Bill there. Hi, Bill. Nice to see you, Bill. Everyone should. By the way, just as an aside, because we're we're being generous. Bill Brown. You should follow him on um, Instagram because his stories, especially at the moment, are an insight into America and the politics. And it's great. Hey, Bill Brown's actually going to be leading a, 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 a fragment of history of photography workshop for us coming up. So shout out to Bill and you can find yeah. that on the, the Like I think Academy at, site. At Bill Brown, everyone should follow him because he's, uh, he's current, really, really good stuff. Very good. Well, you know, I want to share with everybody how they can stay in touch with you, uh, Matt, and also give a little sneak preview to something that is coming up uh, next spring, uh, Think Like a Street Photographer, uh, which, you know, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I think we should do, I know the original title was, title was Get Lucky with Matt Stewart, which mm -hmm. I think we should do as a series of workshops when we're all able to travel again. Oh, I would love that. I would love that. I would love to. I'm, and you know what? I miss doing workshops. I miss, um, you know, miss actually hanging out with people in the real world. I mean, this is great. You're, yeah. you're virtually wonderful, Tom. 
Back at you, man. Thank you very much for, for taking the time, staying up late with us. Uh, everybody, you can stay in touch with Matt through his Instagram here uh, and also his website, which, you know, it has this great video right at the, at the front that gives you, I think, a little bit of an idea of what it's like to walk on the street with Matt. And, um, you know, especially when he gets engaged, nothing else in the world is, is uh, happening. He's very, very focused when, uh, when he sees a moment. And that video shows that pretty well. And Matt, briefly, um, two other groups that you're a part of in terms of the greater photo community. Uh, What's Up Photographers, all of that, What's Up, but upphotographers.com. Up what, what is yeah, this? Yeah, it's a group of, uh, you know, for better term, street photographers. Uh, it's... It, it's really, for me anyway, it's a, a great bunch of people, really good street photographers. It came out of the old in public, which um, collapsed and we set up this uh, new site called upphotographers.com. It's upphotographers on Instagram. And it's just basically a bunch of really great people, great photographers, all different types of photography um, and cool. very, very sort of intelligent, supportive kind of group of people. Joel Meyerowitz is actually a, a member. And then MAPS is, um, is an agency, it's a European agency, but it has uh, photographers from all over the world, some great photographers that you should, everyone should check out, uh, Hannah Reyes Morales, John Trotter, um, uh, you know, John Vink, who's an ex-Magnum guy, Gail Turin. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of really great photographers that people should check, not necessarily street, but just fantastic uh, photography. Uh, and a bunch of new members, by the way. We've got a whole bunch of new members, and their work blows my blows my mind. Well, Matt, I, you've been very generous with your time, and you know you you have uh, you're very generous in in supporting the photo community in general, even remotely. Uh, and it's been a, really a pleasure to hear your stories and get to to, to connect here virtually for a little while. You're I look forward kind. to uh, when we can have a dinner again. I can't wait. Thank also, you for being with us, everybody. We thank you, will... everyone. We will see you next time on Like a Conversations. Thanks for being here.